Okay, good. Okay. And north. All right. So if we could uh, get started here. That was a great exercise, learning who everyone is, learning it from someone else. Uh, this, is, uh, this summer school is, has the idea that each of us, you, you especially, are experts in part of heliophysics, right? This whole system that goes from the center of the sun out through the solar system, includes all of the planets, magnetospheres, and ionospheres. There's all this expertise on each of these different areas. But there is this system that really benefits from people who know something about the whole system. Uh, and so it was with that idea that the summer school was first started. Uh, I think this is now its 13th year, uh, something like that. And, um, it initially developed a series of textbooks, and you've all, right, you've all seen the textbooks. I'm sure you've read every word of them. Uh, well, anyway, the idea was that would contain the information for a person who, say, working on, like me, the solar corona and solar flares, to say, what do I need to know about the ionosphere? What do I need to know about planetary magnetospheres without becoming an expert in any of those fields? So uh, you are sort of tasked with also that, sort of getting to know the other areas. And one of the ideas we had was, at least as a practicing helios, heliophysicist, there are th things about those other areas that you should know the answers to the questions. So for instance, one was why the sun and planets have magnetic fields. Um, and so even if you, you know, you're not working in any area like that, if someone asked you why they have magnetic fields, you should have a, a working knowledge. Uh, and the, the textbooks give you that. Um, and as to demonstrate that this is really possible, I set myself the task of developing lectures that could introduce to those of you who are not experts in an area those fundamentals. Then we have experts like Professor Chandran back there, who really work on the solar wind. And so I'm going to give you the answer to the question, why the sun has a corona and why it has a solar wind. So if you're outside of, of, uh, heli if you're outside of, of some specialty like uh, helios heliospheric physics, you might not immediately know that. Uh, and just to prove that how valuable these are, I got a lot of the information I'm going to give you and a lot of knowledge that I have from the textbooks. So basically, you're going to see the figures that have been in these textbooks, which is how I learned the answers to this question. Um, and to give you an idea of you know, why you would have to answer that question, here's where I was three weeks ago. This is the Saratololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile. Uh, there's a bunch of, these are, well, people from the United States House of Representatives, as well as nighttime astronomers, none of whom could tell you off the top of their head why the heck they were seeing this. This is the total eclipse that we saw three weeks ago. Uh, and you see that little tiny black disk is the sun, and the corona is very big, which by the time you're done with this, you know, means it's very hot. <laughs> The sun has a corona because the corona is very hot, OK? And so I, you know, one, one of the things I was able to do was explain to my nighttime colleagues the answer to that question, why the uh, sun has a corona. But of course, this is a fun way to see the corona. But the way practicing solar physicists see it is from space and, for instance, in the extreme ultraviolet. So this is an image from a different time when it was a little more interesting of the solar corona and, and uh, 193 angstroms uh, made by the SDO spacecraft. Not all that important for those of you who aren't specialists to know. The most important thing to know, you see these images a lot. What you're seeing 
is material that's all about the same temperature, all about a million and a half Kelvin. Uh, and some places are dark, some places are not. We're going to talk about why that is. The important thing to know is where you see bright material here, high intensity material, or a lot of emission, the material is not any hotter, it is denser. Okay? So what you're really sensitive to in these images is the density. So there's very high density here, very low density here. Everything is the same temperature. The image over here is very much like you would have seen when they first developed the telescope. This is in sort of white light. I mean, it's, it's not exactly the broadest white light. But there are the sunspots we all know about. Uh, and so you can see there is a correlation between where there are sunspots and where there is this high density material. This is the magnetic field measured using Zeeman, uh, Zeeman uh, splitting of the, uh, I think this is an iron line. Uh, but the important thing is it's white where there's strong magnetic fields coming towards you, black where there's strong magnetic fields coming away from you. Where there are sunspots, that's where you see this black and white. And where you see the black and white, you definitely do see higher density material. So the high density actually does come from uh, heating of the plasma heating of this material, but the heating tends to make the plasma dense. It's not making it too much hotter because everything you're seeing is the same temperature. And that heating must have something to do with magnetic fields. I know some of you are working on the coronal heating problem. I will not, I will not uh, steal your thunder. I will not explain why magnetic fields will heat the corona. I will just explain that because there is such a magnetic heating, it will create a high density corona. And the basic picture to start with for this high density portion known as an active region where there are magnetic fields that are strong is the magnetic fields are strong enough that they hold the plasma in place and they, they are closed. They have two foot points. So a magnetic loop here that goes from there over to there. I've just drawn a cartoony version of one. This is supposed to be a bunch of magnetic field lines. I've only drawn one in green uh, and it goes from this low uh, temperature uh, surface portion to into the corona. Okay? And there's plasma that just can't get off of this magnetic field line. More importantly, there's some mysterious mechanism related to the magnetic field, which is adding heat to the corona, adding heat to this plasma. And if it just kept adding heat, it would get hotter and hotter and hotter. Eventually, it reaches a balance where it radiates the, heat, the energy away. So there's a balance between the heat coming in and the radiation carrying the heat away. Uh, if, if we thought about it that way, then we would say, OK, we just have a balance between heat and radiation. Here's the radiation, the radiative loss term. And this is, again, I've given you the exact equation that is in the uh, textbooks, volume one. Uh, it is a product of the density of electrons, the density of, of any other ion, but we use the density of hydrogen and then multiply by the abundance of the different ions. You can see we care about hydrogen, silicon, carbon, oxygen, and iron. They're doing a lot of the radiating. Um, this lambda is known as the radiative loss function. It combines all the atomic physics that tells you how you get from hot ions and electrons to radiation. It gives you the number of ergs per, well, you have to multiply by these things here. And if you're at constant pressure, you have pressure squared times this function here. That's what I plotted over here. So you can see this has a very unusual property, not what you expect for material. As the temperature goes up from a, a brisk 10,000 Kelvin up to a million or 10 million Kelvin, the efficiency of the plasma to radiate goes down. It radiates less. Okay, this is a very odd property, but it is, it is crucial for understanding our solar corona. So when we have heat added in, let's just say we have, yeah, that's, that's what that is. We have uh, some amount of heat, bergs per, per uh, centimeter squared, uh, coming in. This is the amount of heat in we need somewhere here, just focus on the green curve. The red curve is, is just a slightly different version of the same thing. Part, part of that is just to 
let you know that, that we still are working with imperfect tools when we're trying to understand this. But we need a balance. And so this is where you would get a balance. Heat in, radiation out from the green curve. The real problem with this getting less efficient as you get hotter is that if I imagine I'm at balance and then something knocks me so that I get a little bit hotter, same amount of heat in, but now less radiation out, less cooling. What happens if I, if I tip the balance that way? What's going to happen to the temperature of the plasma if it now has more energy going in than out? Is it going to cool off? No, it's going to heat up. The temperature is going to go up even further. So I got into trouble because I was a little too hot. And then as a result, I get even hotter, which makes the problem worse. And it runs away. It feeds back. If you go the other way, same thing happens. I get a little too cold. I now radiate more effectively. I cool off even faster. So this tells you that this simple balance just doesn't work. And you have to go to something, you have to go to something that is so this whole range is essentially thermally unstable. You just can't have plasma that is heated and cooling off radiatively between about 10,000 Kelvin and some tens of millions of Kelvin. If you're below 10,000 Kelvin, you're OK. The curve looks very different there. Radiative physics looks very different there. So th th there just is a rule that plasma doesn't want to be at those temperatures. Um, what you have to do is add one other factor in here, and that's thermal conduction. The heat wants to go from high temperatures to low temperatures. You need a one-dimensional model. You basically have to look at the entire loop and understand this differential equation, or at least this cartoon, where the heat comes in wherever it comes in. It radiates out wherever it radiates out. And then if there are places that are too hot, thermal conduction will take the heat from the hot place to the cool place. And you'll see the density is actually going to be inversely related to the temperature. So places that are cool have higher density. Those actually radiate much more effectively because the, that curve there goes down as the temperature goes up. That's what we saw was a problem. But also, the de that's basically telling you the density is going up where the temperature is low. So you can radiate very effectively from the ends. That's where radiation is mostly going to come from the ends. And where it comes in is wherever, all the way along the loop. And so the heat from the middle, where the temperature is high, will conduct down to where it can radiate out. So you have heat deposited everywhere, and then conduction. And then this radiation here in the maroon is much more effective. It comes from the, the feet. And that's really why we get these coronal loops. It's also why you have. A corona that is so hot that is in the millions of Kelvin regime, and then a temperature gradient at the feet that is where all the heat is leaving that, that place that's unable to radiate it away and going into what's known as the transition region in these green areas and the chromosphere below. That's where most of the radiation comes out. Um, and when you put this all together, if you solve this differential equation, it's not a super hard differential equation to solve. You can get uh, some solutions. I'm just going to flash up the way these things scale. So you'll find the pressure then has to be related to the heating rate and the length of the loop. Because the length of the loop comes in in this term here in this way. Let's focus more on the temperature. The temperature has to scale as a very low power of the heating, only the 2 7 power. So if you that's sort of if you increase the heating by a factor of eight, you'll raise the temperature by a factor of two only, which is why we tend to see a corona that is in these millions of Kelvin range, but not too much hotter, not too much colder. It's really insensitive to the amount of heat you put in. Yeah? Oh, radiation. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Please shout out any questions. That's, that's the radiative losses. That's this term here, which is telling you how much is, how much is being radiated. This is telling you how much is being conducted. And this is the heat coming in. Okay. Uh, so this is, this is a crucial point, that the temperature is not so sensitive. The density is much more sensitive. And the brightness 
is very sensitive to the heating. The brightness follows the density. Therefore, if I double the amount of heating in a loop, I double its brightness, more than double its brightness. That's slightly greater than 1. So this is what you're seeing, is you're really seeing where the heat is being deposited, but not because it makes anything hotter. Right? In fact, if we didn't have thermal conduction, it would make it colder. But we have thermal conduction, so it does behave a little bit intuitively. You add heat, it gets a little hotter. But mostly, it gets denser and gets brighter. This is the energy balance that goes on in our traditional corona. Uh, and so what you see here again is, well, this is slightly hotter temperature. This is 2 million Kelvin. This is a place where the heating is greater than the radiation. You're mostly seeing places that are dense and conducting downward. You see the loops. You see this high temperature portion of this temperature versus length plot. This is a, is a spectral range where what we see is the transition region. So you see these bright areas known as plage. This is where the radiation is coming out. Okay? This is actually a lot more. It doesn't look as impressive, but there's a lot more energy coming out here than coming out here uh, in radiation. And that's because all of the heat has been conducted down to a temperature. This is about 10, 000, uh, 100,000 Kelvin, where the radiation is very effective right here. So the radiative losses go up. It's all related to the magnetic field, naturally. Uh, I'm going to skip that part because understanding the, the region below that is pretty nasty. And we're really not in this summer school ever going to encounter that. Here is just some data to convince you that by the, in the, at the end of the day, if you look at the amount of energy coming out of all sorts of different things, including these are different stars. Uh, I think these are Titori stars, which are little oddball stars. You look at the amount of magnetic flux. This is Gauss centimeters squared, also known as Maxwell's in all of these different features. And here's the amount of radiation coming out in x-rays. And they're related. So this is, this is empirical evidence that the uh, heating of the corona is magnetic. You have more magnetic fields, you get more heating. And then we've just seen the reason you get more x-rays is because that's the only way the energy can leave the system. It has to come out in radiation. And x-rays are, are part of that. Okay, and. The magnetic flux on the sun and the magnetic field strength of the sun varies over a solar cycle. Uh, so here is an image made with a Yoko soft X-ray telescope, 1996, all the way to 2001. You can see very little X-rays coming out of the sun in 1996. Here is the brightness in, yeah, you can barely see it, but that's 1996 right there. Uh, this is measured by the GOES spacecraft, which just measures all the x-rays coming out of the sun. And it goes up and then comes back down. That's because the magnetic field of the sun increases during the solar maximum and then decreases back down again. So this is all uh, from 1996 there, what we know as cycle 23. So the brightness in x-rays is going up by more than an or by a factor of 50, even a factor of 100 over the course of the solar cycle. And that's really because there's that much more uh, magnetic field to host the heating and to host the uh, development of the, the high density corona. Um, and here is a blow up of just a little region here. And there's the red curve. And it looks pretty. You can see there's a lot of what you would think might be noise. It is, it is real activity. Uh, here is what happens when you blow up a day. And then if you blow up that day here, sorry, this is a whole month. This is the month of April. And then here's uh, basically three days in April. And you can see that each of these spikes is a solar flare. So the fact that you see all of this activity is not noise in the measurement. It's just the fact that this process of producing a corona and producing x-rays is a variable process. It really has to do with how much energy is going in there. And a flare is a very sudden increase in the amount of energy going into the system. Uh, and so 
there is an idea, many of you, some of you may be working on this, that really what you're seeing in coronal heating as a whole is a lot of flares. Like a lot of these little things are just the background heating of the corona. Uh, that, that is a question that we're still trying to unravel. But it, we do know that the, the flares are uh, a sort of sudden addition of heat into this system that behaves just the way I've been uh, explaining. That the energy goes in, the density goes up, x-rays come out, and you're, you're back where you started. Um, that also leads us to, is that really a big source of, of uh, radiation from the sun? The answer is no. Here is the brightness of the sun as a function of wavelength. This is done in nanometers. Uh, if you want angstroms, you just multiply by 10. So this is 100 angstroms. There's sort of the 193 would be right there. Uh, the blue curve is how bright the sun is. This is a logarithmic scale. Here is the visible. This is the place our eyes work. And the reason our eyes work this way is because that's the peak of the solar emission. This is all coming from the photosphere, places where the, t the temperature is close to 6,000 Kelvin. This is a black body curve for 5770 Kelvin. And it works very well there and not so well over here because nothing I've talked about for the corona has anything to do with black body radiation. Uh, and that's how bright the sun is in, in this range, this extreme ultraviolet. The x-rays are over here. Uh, all of this stuff is coming from the corona. So that lets you know why it is that we study the solar corona from space. We can't observe any of this stuff from the ground. We'll get to that a little more on Thursday. Uh, this green curve is actually the variability. How, how much does the uh, brightness vary as a function of sort of day-to-day -day variation? This is a tenth of a percent variability. Over the visible, the sun is very steady. It does not vary that much. When you get, to, we've already seen, when you get to the x-rays, it varies by basically orders of magnitude. And that's, that's that portion of the curve. So not only is the sun <coughs> brighter in the visible, it's a lot less variable. And the corona, because that's much more variable, is, uh, varies that much more. This is a sort of uh, version of it blown up from uh, the EVE instrument on SDO. Just gives you the details of how, how complicated that spectrum is. Uh, we'll keep going on. This is, this is what's known as the Lyman continuum right here, and the Lyman jump uh, for hydrogen. Uh, I want to jump on to what will actually be much more of a focus for this summer school. And that is, what happens in these regions here, which appear so much darker in this coronal image? Uh, as we saw, that doesn't really mean it's colder, but it does mean it's a lot less dense. So, that means there's something else going on other than this story I told you about heat coming in, turning into conduction, which then has to balance the heat coming in, and you get this uh, bright, dense material here. In these regions here, the magnetic field, rather than being closed at both ends, so the only place for the heat to go was out through radiation, these magnetic field lines are open. So we now have another term in our energy loss. We can actually move the plasma out parallel to the magnetic fields. B is large still. It's not that the magnetic field is that much weaker here. But it actually constrains the plasma from moving across it, but not along it. So material can flow outward. And if you have a flow of material, then you have another energy loss term that is the advective energy loss term. Here you can recognize uh, kinetic energy, 1 half rho v squared. Rho is the uh, mass density of the plasma. V is the velocity of the plasma. Velocity squared, rho v squared, that's the kinetic energy. And then another factor of V, that's the flow of, magnetic, of kinetic energy. And here's the flow of thermal energy. This is actually known as enthalpy. Um, and the 
enthalpy of an ideal gas with a, a adiabatic index gamma. Don't worry if this is uh, kind of unfamiliar to you. The important thing is that we have a relationship between the density of the plasma and its thermal energy content. And then with a flow, you're actually moving that, hot, that material off the sun, and it's carrying the energy away with it. So this is the crucial difference, is you have heat coming in, you have flow carrying the heat away, and you have radiation carrying the heat away. Now, we already saw that radiation is not all that much help. <laughs> Uh, so when, when you have something that's a little more useful, that's what's really going to do all the work. And so the, the advective outflow is much more effective than the radiative losses. And what we get is essentially a situation where we can ignore the radiation and just balance the heat going in and the flow going back out. Okay, this is, this is the story of the solar wind. This is a coronal hole. This is the region that the solar wind comes from. So already we've got our answer. Why is there a coronal wind? Why is there a corona? It's because something is magnetic is heating the, the plasma. And where it's unable to leave the sun, it just has to get dense and bright. Where it is able to leave the sun, it leaves to carry that heat away. And that's the solar wind. The whole, its whole purpose is to carry away the heat <laughs> that's being added to this low portion of the corona through these, through these magnetic processes. And you will hear more from Professor Chandran about the details of how that energy is thermalized and turned into heat and then accelerates the solar wind. I'm going to give you the version that was first unraveled in 1958 by Gene Parker, and they've ultimately named the, uh, sorry, 66. Um, I think that's the right, nope, 58. Strike that. Uh, yeah, it's an it's a interesting story if you've ever, if you haven't heard it. It's a story of uh, how, how science actually ends up being done. He had this idea of how heating is going to lead to a solar wind and what's going to happen. And he wrote a paper and submitted it. And he had some referees that said, this is preposterous. You know, I've written papers that say this shouldn't happen. <laughs> and, and this guy d didn't read my papers. Uh, and ultimately, Gene Parker uh, had an office right down the hall from the editor of the journal, uh, a fellow named uh, Subra, named Chandra. We all call him Chandra, Chandra Sekar. Uh, and um, he came and he said, look, the, these referees, they, they say your paper's wrong. And Gene Parker said, they said they don't like my paper. They never pointed to a reason it was wrong. And Chandra said, OK, you know, I'm the editor. Referees are advisory. That's not always appreciated. But uh, the editor said, sure, we're going to publish it. And eight years later, they launched spacecraft that actually detected the solar wind doing exactly what he said. So the uh, Parker Solar Probe is, is another step in that. And we're going to hear more about that over the course of the summer school. But here is the analysis that he first provided. And that was following the uh, sort of hints I just provided here, the energy loss rate. And here is the, uh, the rho times v. And I factored that out. Here's the 1 half v squared and the enthalpy. And here is gravitational potential energy, because potential energy is always part of energy. Uh, and so this is the amount of energy flowing along this flux tube, including potential energy, which is changing as you go from uh, low places to high places. And if you're in steady state, it is this function here that has to be fixed. This is the cross-sectional area times the this, all times this. This is the idea that if heat is coming in at some constant rate, then heat must be going out at this constant rate. And this is the equation for the constant rate. The way I've factored it, this part here is the amount of mass leaving the sun. And this is basically the energy per unit mass. So we, we're going to make two assumptions that the, the thing is in steady state. Both the amount of energy leaving the sun is steady, and the mass loss is steady. So whatever this 
is here, this is also a constant. And we can just work with what's in square brackets. If it's a constant time, something is constant, the something must be constant. So that is the constant. This is actually Bernoulli's law, for those of you who remember uh, more basic uh, hydrodynamics. It probably wasn't written this way when you first saw it in freshman year, but it's basically the kinetic energy per unit mass, the enthalpy per unit mass, and the potential energy per unit mass. Psi is the gravitational potential energy. Um, so that's what must be constant if you imagine, now to make our life even simpler, I told you that uh, the ideal gas law would give you this kinds of enthalpy. I want to take an even simpler case where whatever is happening to the gas, it's going to maintain its temperature uh, to be constant. It's going to be isothermal. That really is a consequence of thermal conduction, which I haven't put in here, and I'm trying to sneak in the back door. I'm saying Thermal conduction is, is basically going to redistribute the temperature so that it's more uniform. The great thing about that is that just turns this rather nasty thing into a natural log, which is a, a wonderful function to work with. And then if you just write this whole thing down and use the fact that this is a constant, you actually find out that what has to be a constant involves the square of the velocity, the natural log of the velocity, and the natural log of the cross-sectional area and this thing here. Finally, you can say, well, this involves only velocity. This is just some function of velocity. And this is only a function of position. So you have a function of velocity plus a function of position must be constant. And while there's still some math to be done, you can sort of smell how this is going to work. We're just going to basically have to invert one of these functions, or we're going to graph them, which is a much better way, in my opinion. The critical thing about this function of velocity is when v gets very, very small, then v squared goes to 0, but the natural log goes to minus a large number. So minus the natural log goes to a large number. It blows, f blows up. When v gets very big, natural log doesn't, it's kind of um, lackadaisical about becoming big. But v squared sure does become big. So it becomes big for both small velocities and large velocities. And it has a minimum when the velocity is the speed of sound. Okay? It, kind of, it kind of gives you the, the smallest contribution to this constant when, it's, when the velocity is the speed of sound. The next thing is we need to work out the the geometry. And for that, the simplest thing is, rather than that cool looking bell uh, trumpet shaped curve, I'm going to, give you a, uh, going to give you a cone. So the cross-sectional area will just go as uh, inversely with radius. And the gravitational potential will go inversely as radius squared. And so it goes as, or sorry, it goes as radius. Uh, so S is essentially R. And we can work out this other function, which is also a logarithm and inverse of R. Most importantly, let's graph it. This has a sort of opposite behavior to the function we just plotted. As R becomes very, very small, uh, there really shouldn't be a minus sign. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, this is going to dominate. This is the guy who's going to win when r becomes small. This, while it becomes uh, large and negative, it's not nearly as large as that. So it blows up in the negative direction. And then as r becomes very, very big, this term goes away. And our slowly increasing function of r goes up. So g is curved downward. And we have to have a sum of these two curves, f and g, being constant. And here is the contour plot of that sum. And you don't have to take my word for it. This is essentially plotting every value where the sum of f and g are constant. They follow these curves. Here is radius. This is velocity over the sound speed. So here's that minimum in f, essentially where the f curve is the smallest it can be. Going up here and going down there, f is becoming bigger. And when we go to the left, g becomes very large and negative. As we go right, g becomes very large and negative. 
This is the saddle point, the place where G is the maximum and F is the minimum. And there are two contours that go straight through there. Every other contour is above that minimum possible value where F and G are both essentially the balance each other that way. And this shows us every solution to that steady state flow problem. Okay? Every possible steady state flow is a single curve on this plot. And some of them look a little weird. This is a curve that basically starts at zero radius, goes to a maximum radius, and then goes back in again. That doesn't make any sense. We're looking for a function of r, and this is a double-valued function. So we would never consider any curves over here. Same with curves over here. These are curves. Okay, illustrate them over here. These are curves that basically give us, oops, yeah, so that's, that's CS. Sorry, sometimes my talking gets ahead of my presentation. These are curves that start out at small radii, fairly slow, and they're accelerating because they're picking up speed from the pressure gradient. And they reach a maximum velocity right here, and then they start slowing down again. They never get close to the speed of sound. They're, these are things escaping at speeds, flow speeds below the speed of sound. These other curves here are things that never become subsonic. They leave the sun going supersonically, and they slow down. And we'll get to a, a, a strange behavior of uh, supersonic flow that makes this possible. But they slow down as they get to this region here, and then they speed back up again. The magic curves. So this is actually, let me, let me give you an analogy. This is, a, this is an analogy with flows, say, from a high pressure tank or a rocket nozzle, a rocket combustion chamber, out through a nozzle and then out through an expanding area. So you have flow that has to go through at a steady mass flux, and then it encounters this region where the area decreases. And we've all had a lifetime living in a fluid like the air. Um, actually, two days ago, I was floating my way down the Yellowstone River, uh, and I was paying attention to how you know, the water was going through. And when things get narrow, and you have to drive the same amount of mass through a narrow opening, does the, speed, does the flow go faster or slower through the narrow opening? It goes faster. It picks up speed. Definitely what the Yellowstone does when you get to, to narrow regions, you get faster flow. Uh, so you come along, and then you get faster, and then you get to the throat, and you start to slow down again. Okay? Well, that is actually, you all betrayed your, your bias towards subsonic flows. We've all lived our lives at subsonic speeds, most of us. If anyone here has been a, a military fighter pilot, you actually have to do supersonic hydrodynamics then. And it behaves exactly the opposite. If you drive a supersonic flow through a nozzle, when it gets to that narrow region, it slows down. That's exactly the opposite of what a subsonic flow does. Okay? It has to slow down, and then when it gets past the throat, it'll speed back up again. Okay? And if you do that, in either case, whatever the pressure is here, it's going to be the same there. Because in Bernoulli's law, essentially this has gone away. And so we have a balance between the kinetic energy and the cross-sectional area. And once the kinetic energy gets back to the same value, the cross-sectional cross area gets back to the same area, that the uh, flow gets back to the same area. So there's no way in driving flows from one area through a nozzle to the other area to change the pressure unless you do it as follows. You start out subsonically, you pick up enough speed, because you're subsonic and you see this opening coming at you, you speed up, you pick up just enough speed so when you reach the throat of that nozzle, you are going exactly at the speed of sound. Okay? Now you're a supersonic flow and you start to see the nozzle open again, but as a supersonic 
fluid, you respond to that by speeding up more. Okay? And this is transonic flow. This is flow that goes from subsonic to supersonic. This is also what happens if you have a scuba tank. At least one person said the hobby was scuba diving. And you are on the boat and you open the nozzle just to make sure you've got a full tank. The flow escapes and it's going supersonically. One thing they teach you in scuba diving classes is don't put your hand in front of the nozzle when you open it. It will hurt you because it is supersonic. <laughs> And it's also loud. People on the boat will also not appreciate the fact that you've just given them a sonic boom. Uh, but you just do that to test things. So this is what happens when you have high pressure gas escaping through a throat. It always goes transonic, right at that narrowest point. That is really the exact same story we have in the solar wind. Okay, the <coughs> the. Low, if, you, if you have drive this through at a low enough mass loss rate, then you're going to stay on the subsonic flow. The maximum rate you can drive material off of that, through that throat, is if it becomes, so, uh, becomes sonic at the, at the nozzle point. And here we don't have a nozzle, we have a cone. But it's that other term, that gravitational term, that plays a role, and it's a role in velocity space, not in physical space, uh, really, that th narrows the, the, uh, the virtual throat down right at this radius here. And the solar wind must be on that point because the pressure, as we've seen in the corona, is a lot higher than the pressure in interstellar spa interplanetary space. And so it's got to be on that same curve that gets it from subsonic to supersonic. And then by the time you reach out into the interplanetary space, the solar wind is going supersonically. Okay, So it's, it's gone through that, that nozzle point um, and essentially reached the, uh, the supersonic speed that it needs. If you back out all the math, one of the things you'll then see is the mass loss rate is set by the heating rate. Okay, that's, that really came from that's what established the energy loss rate, Q, which is what we needed to have be constant. So by the time you've done all this, you find out that your star is going to lose material. It's going to go supersonically at a rate that's proportional to the energy, the, the heating rate. Uh, the density everywhere is set by the restrictions posed by this, inter, uh, by this uh, transonic curve. And so once you know the heating rate, you should know the density everywhere else. Uh, and the density that you're talking about there is going to be lower than the density you see if you didn't have access to to this uh, advective loss rate. Okay, so the density here is dictated again by the heating, but it's dictated by a balance between the heat that goes in and the outflow, as we've just mapped out. That's why you see these low density regions, the coronal holes. Those are regions where the energy can be lost through flow. And then in the closed region, that's not available. So they have to raise their density up high enough that they can do this trick with radiation and conduction down. And this, this sort of explains why you see these two regions and also where that solar wind comes from. It's now 45 minutes. Are there any questions on this? I know for some of you, this is all very simple. And that's intended. Question, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, that was the trick when I said we were going to pretend this whole thing was isothermal. The speed of sound is proportional to the square root of temperature. So if I make the temperature constant, I make the speed of sound constant. That's why these curves are so easy to see there. Uh, you can do this all without making that assumption. The graphs are just less easy to interpret. So I did this mostly for clarity. But uh, it's, it's not, there's a grain of truth in it, in that thermal conduction does want to make the temperature more uniform. And it does tend to make the temperature at least low down 
less variable than you would see if you didn't have thermal conduction. But yeah, that's a good, sorry, I, I forgot to really emphasize that. I didn't want to get weighed down in the math, but I do want, do want that intuition of if you're subsonic, you're going to, as, as the throat gets smaller, you're going to speed up. And then when you become supersonic, when the throat gets larger, you speed up more. And now you're in supersonic land. Um, any other, before we take a, a small break? Um, question, yeah. What's the opposite? Opposite of? Right, oh, this here? Ah, this is an interesting curve. This is the, I think, Bondi accretion curve, <laughs> although you would, you would go the other way. This is nighttime astronomers are interested in these objects where mass is accreted onto, say, a neutron star or a black hole. And it goes subsonic far away, picks up speed, and then is going supersonic by the time it reaches its black hole. Um, so those of you who fancy yourselves going into that line of work, you would pay attention to that. For us, this is, this is the curve that gets from subsonic to supersonic. And this is, this is the curve that Parker, as, as I've shown you, that this kind of idea was known from more traditional hydrodynamics. But he pointed out that the solar corona would have this kind of behavior, the Parker, uh, Parker wind, as we call it. And I don't know, maybe Ben knows. Did Parker do that work before or after Bondi? OK. There you go. So, so I don't know if Bondi had as much difficulty convincing referees of his result, but uh, Parker's story is, is a valuable one to carry with you. Uh, just if, if you believe you're right, um, and then you, you should stick to your guns. Uh, another valuable thing for later, when you're refereeing a paper, focus on the scientific results of the paper and not on your personal emotional reaction to the paper. <laughs> okay, that was, that was what these other people were doing. And fortunately, they had an editor who was wise enough to see the difference. Uh, and Parker stuck to his guns because he knew they had failed to criticize his scientific results and were more criticizing his him for being too young or not falling in line with the rest of the thinking in the field. Okay, let's uh, take a five minute break. We'll, we'll get back here and talk more about the solar wind.
Okay, welcome back. I was reminded that uh, maybe I could have talked a little bit more about how how the fluid that's being forced through this uh, this nozzle once you once you accept that these equations are really the same as for a nozzle, how it is that, that the fluid from way down here, where there's lots of possible speeds that the flow could be leaving the sun, how does it know to leave at this magical speed? And the answer is hidden from us because we assumed it was in steady state. We assumed at the very beginning that it had found this, this uh, flow that they didn't ever need to change. And the trick is if it's going too fast, okay, and it was on one of these curves, that I already rejected the solution. It's not that it's bad to go too fast, but it's that you will not find a steady state. Your pressure will build up too high before you get to the nozzle, and that excess pressure will propagate backwards. When we're in the subsonic region, when we're below here, information propagates in both directions. Information can actually go upstream and say, hold on, you're, you're going too fast, you're not going to get through the nozzle, there's a, there's a pileup. This is what happens in traffic, right? <laughs> if, if something's nozzling down the traffic, you get all the taillights coming at you saying, okay, we're going a lot slower so we can get through there. So that slows the flow down towards this red line. If it's going too slow, it gets to the nozzle and realizes it has a much higher pressure than anything out in front of it. The important thing is the pressure, which in this isothermal uh, approximation is the density. It sees stuff with much lower density, and it sends the information backwards like pick up speed, we're flowing into a vacuum. We're flowing into something of lower pressure. And so the dynamics then are upwards towards the red line. So at least from here up to here, any time evolution will just basically push the solution onto the steady, steady curve, and thereafter it never changes again because it's found its steady state solution. Once it gets supersonic, information can only go outward. Information in a supersonic flow can only travel downstream, so it just follows this curve because that's essentially like, like throwing a ball. Once it leaves your hand, it's going where it's going. And that's, and that's what's happening here. Once you're on that curve, that's where it's going to go. And the reason you end up speeding up all the time is related to the density, which is hidden here, which is related to the pressure. It's you're flowing into a vacuum. You're flowing out of the sun, out of a corona that has a fairly high pressure into a vacuum. And when you do that, you always flow along that transonic curve. I'm just sort of giving you the, the feedback that pushes you onto the transonic part here, and then it follows that curve. Yeah? Those exist if you had a star that was surrounded by such a high pressure medium that it was in almost in pressure balance with the corona. And then, and this is, I, I like the more homey examples, like you have your high pressure bottle of gas, and you open the valve, and it escapes because it says, wow, you know, the, the material around me is at very low pressure, effectively a vacuum. If you put that high pressure bottle of gas into a high pressure vessel and open the valve, you'd probably get this subsonic escape, where it's escaping into something that's almost the same pressure. And so its pressure goes down as the speed goes up, and then it goes back up as the speed goes down. So that's the way to do it. And it, you know, that was the initial fallacy, sort of, when you hear about the, the narrative of how Parker argued there was this solar wind, is if you were to have such an atmosphere or a subsonic flow, you would need for the sun to be surrounded by uh, material everywhere in space that was in balance, pressure balance, with the solar corona. And that just doesn't seem right for a star, right? A star doesn't need to have, you know, some balance with its environment, it exists by itself and it just does whatever it wants. So as long as you're in a low, low pressure environment, you're going to get this supersonic expansion, as long as you feed material back into it. Anything else? All right. So I want to transition over to something that I didn't actually 
I left open, <laughs> excuse the pun, that there, you know, there was regions where the magnetic field was open and regions where the magnetic field was closed. Why? And who determines which is which? Um, why are some field lines open and others closed? Uh, I'll, I'll rush you through some, some basic magnetostatics. Uh, essentially, the magnetic field was strong. I kept emphasizing this. The magnetic field is so strong that there isn't another force out there that can push back against it. So the magnetic, if we express the Lorentz force just in terms of the magnetic field, there's the current, curl of B, and there's another uh, current cross B. We need curl of B and B to be parallel to each other so that there's no force, right? So that J cross B vanishes. That means that the magnetic, the current has to be, have some constant times the magnetic field, has to be some constant times the magnetic field. This is known as a force-free magnetic field. If you haven't seen that before, don't worry, because immediately I'm just going to say by fiat, the simplest <laughs> situation we can imagine is where this constant is zero. So the way we actually get into uh, a magnetic equilibrium is just by having no current. And then there's no force. And no matter how strong the magnetic field is, it doesn't have to, anything to push back on it. So we're in a situation where curl of B is equal to zero, much more similar to electrostatics than magnetostatics. I can write B as the gradient of a scalar potential. I always put the minus sign in there because, as you remember from basic physics courses, the potentials always seem to have a minus sign in front of their gradient. So uh, we just have this. But of course, for the magnetic field, we do need divergence of B to be 0. So that means we're solving Laplace's equation. How many of you have experienced solving Laplace's equation? Yes. I teach the electricity and magnetism course out of Jackson. And all we do is solve Laplace's equation for months and months. And yeah, I know. I, I'm sort of wondering about that. Uh, <laughs> so del squared chi is equal to 0. We solve that. And those of you who do remember how you go to solve that, you use, well, you're in a spherical system. So you use spherical harmonics, right? YLMs. Essentially, you can write. This is the general solution. It's basically the spherical harmonics times an inverse power of radius or a obverse power of radius, something proportional to radius. And the powers are L plus 1 and L. Uh, just a quick reminder of all that. The, the system we're going to think about is the sun here's in this nice orange ball. And there's the solar radius. And we think we know the magnetic field at the surface of the sun. So that will tell us something about the magnetic field. It's actually going to tell us about the normal derivative of chi at the surface. Those of you who do have familiarity with solving Laplace's equation, if I give you a boundary condition in terms of the normal derivative, whose name do we associate with that? It's a what boundary condition? It's prescribed in. No? What? Yes. Newman, Neumann, something like that. Yeah, so, so that's the boundary condition on the inside. And then on the outside, we don't have a surface that we know what the solution should be. We use a, a fiat that the magnetic field there, we're going to say, is purely radial. There's no theta or phi component to the magnetic field, only a BR component. And that means that I'm going to set chi equal to 0 there. That is the other kind of boundary condition. That is the Dirichlet condition. So it's, it's an interesting solution to Laplace's equation. You have a Neumann condition on the inside, Dirichlet condition on the outside. It's a homogeneous Dirichlet condition. You can see I teach Jackson way too much. Uh, and this is the general solution. These harmonics here, so this is arranged so that when little r is big R, this is 1 and this is 1. They cancel out. I've satisfied all my Dirichlet conditions all at one fell swoop. And the last remaining thing is I need the radial magnetic field. That is the radial derivative of chi. That is the Neumann condition. That's what fixes these A's. So in order to know the full solution there, I need to know the magnetic field on the surface of the sun. 
And that is where we come back to these wonderful maps that are made all the time of the magnetic field on the surface of the sun. This is just a line of sight magnetic field. And what one does is take the observation uh, on this date, which I can barely make this out. No, I can't even make it out. August 1996, there's August 20th. Actually, time goes, time goes this way. So August 19th, 18th, 17th, 16th, all the way back to, we don't quite get to July 23rd. But of course, this was in 1996. So as the sun rotates, it's letting you see different parts of the magnetic field. You have to ignore the fact that there are different parts at different times. And we unroll the magnetic field into a single map known as a, uh, a Carrington plot or a synoptic map of the radial magnetic field in degrees of longitude, Carrington longitude from 0 degrees to 360 degrees, and degrees of latitude, 90 degrees minus 90, southern hemisphere, plus 90. So this gives us our full Neumann condition. And we can solve for all the spherical harmonics. And we get a sort of 3D map of the solar magnetic field. And this is what that magical function here looks like when you populated it with, obviously, these are cartoon solutions just to illustrate things. Uh, and this is just the behavior of such a solution, such a function. It has basically the, B, the BR is such that in our synoptic plot, it was positive here and negative here. So this line here is a place where the magnetic field goes through 0 from positive to negative, known as the polarity inversion line. Uh, in this solution, then, I'm putting the radial derivative of, of chi equal to a positive number here, a negative number there. The solutions look like this. They go from the northern hemisphere down to the southern hemisphere. These are closed magnetic field lines. And then you get one closed magnetic field line, or one magnetic field line, that is trying to close, but it gets to a point on the surface where I say it can't have a b theta or b phi. That was my rule. But the consequence of my rule is that magnetic field line is going to end right there. And okay, that's a place where b is actually now completely equal to 0. br is equal to 0, b theta, and b phi. Um, and there's another field line that comes down from there. This is known as the separatrix. It divides all those field lines that will close, going from the north to the south, from all those that essentially leave the north and hit this region where they have to go radially outward. Okay, So this boundary here, the separatrix, separates open field lines, places where the magnetic field goes from the surface out into space. And then down here is the ones that come in. They're basically open, but on the negative side. Okay, So th this is a simple picture. It is known as the potential field source surface model. You now see the the origins of that, the potential field, because I decided curl B was equal to 0. So I could solve it in terms of a potential. And source surface is the name of this magic radius that I put in to say the magnetic field must be radial there. Just because, like any theorist looking for keys, I look under the light post. If, I, if I'm going to solve this problem with uh, solving Laplace's equation, I'm going to use boundary conditions that I know how to use. And I decided I needed a Dirichlet boundary condition somewhere, so I put it right there. Much more sophisticated ways of doing this. Um, but this is the one that is sort of the beginning of everything. When you, when you understand this, you're ready to understand better, better versions. Again, this is out of the textbook. Um, so here is a more legitimate solution. You can see. Uh, got a little more color to it. This is just the picture from uh, basically Carrington rotation 1911 to 1912 and a half. Uh, these, this is the separatrix boundary. This is sort of shown uh, in perspective. There's the region of open field in the north, region of open field in the south. Okay, So it's a very clear picture in, the, in, this, simple, in this simplistic model. When you look down on, 
this. Here is the region of, this is the separatrix. So it all originates from this. Now I've plotted, I'm a, uh, sorry, this, this plot is a little confusing because I'm plotting curves at two different levels. The green and the red are being plotted at the, the surface of the sun, one solar radii. Those are regions where the magnetic field is open, and uh, positive actually <laughs> in this case, uh, and negative up here. And then the blue lines go from that up to the source surface at two and a half solar radii is where, where we put it in this case. Um, and the black curve is at two and a half solar radii. That is the place where B is exactly equal to zero in this model. So all the blue lines originate from there and go down, originate from there and go down. Does everyone have this sort of complicated 3D picture mapped out? And the last point is then I can say, well, in this model at least, I know what the magnetic field is everywhere at two and a half solar radii. So this map here is actually a map of BR at two and a half solar radii. So you see the same black curve here, and then you see contours that are dashed red, solid blue, then dashed gray. These are all the positive regions of positive outward field, and these are regions of positive or negative, therefore inward field, just plotting BR. Of course, by construction in this model, I don't need to plot B theta or B phi, why not, at, at the source surface? Because they're zero. And why are they zero? I, I said they had to be zero, just, just the model. So this tells us everything about the magnetic field at that, sor at that sor source. The reason it's called a source surface is we then think everything outside of there is the solar wind. Okay, that, that, is, where the magnetic, that is where the magnetic field lines are open, all open, and all of that flow that we described that happens to carry energy away from the sun in the, uh, in the regions of open field, they're all flowing out here. But really, in this model, they only originate from the North Pole and the South Pole. Or in this case, you see this nice little peninsula here sticking up. Uh, this magnetic field need not be all that simple. Okay? It all depends on the spherical harmonic coefficients, which depend on the magnetic field I observed. Uh, here, there's a concentration of, of magnetic field at the surface, and it's sort of created this region where the magnetic field is not as simple as it might be. You can see this is the synoptic magnetogram we started with. And the region, the reason for this exclusion here is really related to the magnetic field at the surface, which is fairly concentrated here and here. This period in July, and July of 1996 was fairly quiet and just had a few regions of magnetic field. We we're close to the solar minimum. OK. So far, so good. <laughs> Try to keep an eye on time here. Uh, and here's just another version of that. Um, let's see. Is there? Uh, yeah, OK. So now, as I said, the simple picture has the magnetic field going radially outward at this magic source surface. What does it do after that? Well, we have flow that's going outward along the magnetic field lines. And at that point, it's just traveling out away from the sun. Uh, and it drags the magnetic field with it. So in this simplified picture, there's an abrupt transition between a region inside here where the magnetic field is considered so strong that I can ignore everything else, and across a magic boundary where the magnetic field is so weak, it has no say in the matter. Completely artificial, but just a, 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 very, a very nice way of, of picturing the kinds of balances that have to go on here. Uh, when the magnetic field gets weak, it just gets dragged outward by the solar wind. And the solar wind is just now going outward. One of the things this points out in this simplified picture here 
is we have regions where the magnetic field, this is, this is a, a version. If we're looking from the North Pole, this is very different than the picture I just showed you, only in that the separation between positive field and negative field isn't along the equator, but sort of on a line that goes over the North Pole. That does happen sometimes. This is done more for illustration. But what it means is that place where BR is equal to zero, okay, becomes a region that separates all the inward field from all the outward field. This is called the heliospheric current sheet. Here it's just a line, but somehow it's draped across, and we'll see some more 3D pictures of it. And everything on one side of it is magnetic field that is heading into the sun, and everything on the other side is magnetic field that's heading out from the sun. The red one's going out, the blue one's coming in, and because the sun is rotating, the, the solar wind is actually going radially outward, but <laughs> the field lines themselves get pulled around into a spiral. This is, this is uh, something you, you really have to sort of have some experience with. Again, I like to resort to homey examples. And you can see these nice lawn sprinklers out there, which are spraying drops out and spinning as they go. And you see these beautiful spiral arcs. And then I ask my freshman engineering students what path those little water droplets are making as they leave the sprinkler head. Are they traveling out in a spiral? Because you see these beautiful spirals. Anyone? Are they going in a spiral? Yeah. Exactly right. It's, a, it's all an artifact of having left from different times. Yeah. And so even though they're each making an outward path, they form a pattern that looks spiral. And that's the same thing here. These field line here, the material is just leaving now. This field, this field line here has some material that's going radially outward, but it left earlier. And so you get that same spiral pattern. This is also known as the Parker spiral. Uh, the uh, fact that it's, it's mapped into the magnetic field. And here is a plot that you will see quite a bit more. Oh, Nick has left the room. In your lab exercises this afternoon, this is a uh, simulation. This is a sophisticated simulation from a program known as Enlil. And it shows us all these uh, properties of solar wind in a model just like this, with, uh, with the uh, magnetic field not really playing a, a dynamically important role. Uh, here we have a plot of density. Uh, one of the things that's done here, because uh, we have this property that the, the material is expanding into a uh, expanding cone. The density is dropping off, uh, even though the velocity is staying roughly constant. So they plot the density times the radius squared. That's something that will not vary as much as density itself. And you see these nice patterns where you have uh, some high density reds and greens uh, formed out in these spiral patterns. Again, this material, this high density material, is just propagating outward, but it makes this pattern because it's coming from points that are rotating around with the surface, with the sun. So the sun is in the center here. Uh, these are, uh, let's see, I should see the radial scale here, but um, yeah, I think, oh yeah, well, we can easily work it out because. Earth is this yellow dot. So there is one astronomical unit. Uh, Mars is this red dot here. Uh, so this is one and a half astronomical units. And you can see some of the spacecraft that we care about. Uh, Kepler, Spitzer, Stereo A, they're all present here. So this is the, the more sophisticated modeled version of that picture that I was just showing you. And it, and it has the properties it does for that reason. Here is a, a classic picture of what happens when you really take this, this simple 2D picture and really embed it in three dimensions. What you have is a sun whose heliospheric current sheet comes out not from, always from the equator. Here's a plot of what it looks like uh, when the sun is more active. And it has this 
dip here. Uh, and as the sun rotates, the heliospheric current sheet then forms this warped surface that goes out here. This is closer to solar minimum. So this is where the, the uh, heliospheric current sheet is closer to the equator, but still not exactly on the equator. Um, this, is a, this is sort of the picture of what it looks like at one at the surface of the sun. The, again, positives being white, the radius being, uh, the negatives being black. And then here's the kind of uh, source surface model you get from that. So playing the same games over and over again. And I'll, I'll just go up to this point where we see how it evolves over time. This is the evolution of the solar cycle as it's imprinted on the source surface. And you see it starts out with all the positive in the southern hemisphere. And then it gets very crazy during solar maximum. And now we get to a point where the blues are now all in the southern hemisphere. That's the negative field. And the positive field is all in the northern hemisphere. Okay, And so the, the period when it lo looks very crazy is solar maximum when the photospheric magnetic field is very complicated, leads to a lot of spherical harmonics. One of the things that happens, if you think about the way we were solving Laplace's equation when we were in undergraduate uh, or as first year graduate students, the radial, the radial uh, fall off of the low spherical harmonics is much slower than the fast spherical harmonics. So what really tends to dominate is the dipole moment. This is a plot of, uh, this is fairly complicated, but this is the dipole moment. Uh, don't bother about the units. There's zero dipole moment. This is the sunspot number. Now, I plotted the dipole moment two ways. Green, this is the magnitude of the dipole moment vector. Okay. It, it's a magnitude, so it never goes to, it can go to zero, it can never change sign. So I've plotted it both here and here just for fun. Um, it never really falls off that much. It falls off by about a factor of two. The, red and then smoothed in the blue is just the z component, just the northward southward component of the dipole moment. That is positive or negative. You can see the way that that one that's actually three terms, this is just one term in that, uh, in that spherical harmonic decomposition behaves is it's positive, then it goes through zero, then it's negative, then it goes through zero again, positive goes through zero, and the overall dipole moment tends to be smaller when it doesn't have a z component, but it's not zero because it still has x and y components. But that syncs up with the solar cycle. Here are solar maxima. We've been looking at the period from 1996, which was solar minimum, to sometime around 2005 or 2006, which is another solar minimum. The dipole moment switches from one sign to the other just around solar maximum. That's the time the magnetic field has become very complicated. It's also the point at which this dipole moment has lost its z component. Okay, so this is the exact date that the dipole moment switched from positive to negative in 2000, in 1990, in 1980. Uh, not exactly coincidence with solar max, but this is another, another way of seeing that. So this is something that dictates the evolution of the large-scale solar magnetic field. And it also dictates the evolution of the solar wind. And we'll hear more about this. But this is from the spacecraft Ulysses, which flew over the north pole and south pole of the sun at, at uh, fairly large radii. So these, these are very classic plots. Uh, but they're a little confusing at first. Uh, the image of the sun and the corona, extended corona, are there just as a kind of, uh, not just decoration, but it reminds you this is a period around solar minimum. So the, the disk is not very bright in this, uh, in this image. Uh, the corona is very organized. We see, a nice, uh, we see a nice helmet streamer that comes out of one side and not quite as nice out of the other side. So this is uh, very close to solar minimum. And then in the radial direction is plotted the solar wind speed that Ulysses was measuring. 
So here is a place where the solar wind speed is kind of around 700 kilometers per second over, it doesn't quite get to the North Pole, but over that whole region. So it's plotted as a function of latitude. So you can see that would be the North Pole. It didn't quite go over it, but it came close. Uh, this is the equator. Uh, the solar wind speed is much lower in the equator and much less sort of, much more complicated. <laughs> Uh, but up here, it, it has a steady flow pattern. This is the fast solar wind. This is the slow solar wind that comes out of the equator. And here we see the fast solar wind coming out of the southern hemisphere. When we get to solar maximum, you see all these nice, uh, these nice active regions, bright spots in the, in the solar corona. There's a solar, there's a coronal hole that goes all the way across the equator. So that shows you that this is, there's, there's magnetic, uh, open magnetic field regions coming right down from the equator. It's a very complicated magnetic field. You can also see in the coronagraph, it's very complicated. You can see in the similar plots here of uh, velocity that the velocity is much more complicated. It's fast, it's slow, different places have different speeds. Uh, and then we got back to the third orbit, which was closer to the next solar minimum, and we got a similar kind of pattern. Okay, so so the, the, uh, this whole, this whole uh, idea of having this open magnetic field coming out of different regions, depending on the solution we have to Laplace's equation, is imprinted into the solar wind. And I'm sure we'll hear much more about this in the next few, few lectures. Um, just to uh, dwell on a couple of details which also will come up in this. Uh, we have this fast solar wind that's coming out of the, clo of the open regions, and we have slow solar wind that's coming out of the less open regions, or regions that are open in, in some more complicated fashion. I don't want to dwell on that. But let's just imagine we had a band of slow solar wind and a band of fast solar wind. If it were actually symmetric, which is kind of what this picture here, oops, hit the wrong button. This picture, uh, picture here would have you believe that this is just all independent of, of uh, phi, then it would be cool. You just have this band where there's slow solar wind and this band where there's fast solar wind. But as we've seen, these spherical harmonics don't exactly line up with the z-axis of the sun. So we can have a region where the slow solar wind is coming from this band here, but in some places that band is in the southern hemisphere, and in so other places the band is in the northern hemisphere. And the solar wind is leaving the sun, either going fast or slow, and that's it. But as the sun rotates, places where the fast wind was coming from the northern hemisphere, you're going to get to a place where now there's slow wind behind it. Okay, And what happens when you have traffic that's fast up ahead of traffic that's slow? They sort of spread out. That's all well and good. What happens when the slow traffic is in front of the fast traffic? What happens to your car? You're in that fast traffic, move, making good time. But then up ahead of you are some people who are you know, really testing that minimum speed limit that they'll post. What happens? Yeah. Compression, right? You build up. Your taillights go on. And pretty soon, you have a high density of cars. That's what happens here. You get this, what are known as interaction regions. And this is the place where the fast solar wind is behind the slow solar wind, and they press up against each other. And over time, <laughs> this is what you don't want to have happen in traffic. There's actually such high compression that it becomes a shock. And you actually have a place where the, the uh, Density gradients have steepened as much as they can. And you actually have a shock wave that goes out. And it goes out away from that, but it goes away from that region where things have steepened up in the reference frame of the solar wind. But it's going backwards and forwards. And so you have what's known as a forward shock. This is actually going outward in the reference frame of the solar wind, which is also going outward, so the forward shock is actually moving outward. And you have a reverse shock. And that is moving outward as well, but it's moving <laughs> backwards in the reference frame of the solar wind. So you'll see these two different, these two different structures in the solar wind. And these are 
Uh, these are the kinds of things that, that do go on. And so here's, a, here's another picture of that, the fast, the slow, and the, and the slow. And of course, where you have slow behind fast, you get rarefaction. That's that nice situation where the, the density of cars gets increasingly small uh, as the fast cars keep speeding up ahead and the slow cars stay behind. And then you have this region here, the compression region. This is where the fast solar wind catches up to the slow solar wind, and we get those shocks. And so these are, these are structures that we see throughout the solar wind, and they're caused by this, this interaction of these fast and slow solar winds. The, uh, then here's a sort of time-resolved re time version of this, also from uh, your textbooks, where you see the density gradient building up and then turning into a shock and then propagating outward. Here's actually the speed. And you can see the characteristic jump where you basically have a jump at the shock wave. Two jumps, actually, one there and one there. So they're propagating. This is the reverse shock. This is the forward shock. Okay, And here would be the speed of a steady, steady flow in this picture. All making sense? All right. So let's just pull back and sort of think about what this means for the whole heliophysics system. Uh, here, I've just basically tried to take this entire, well, taking the radiation zone and the convection zone, which we haven't talked about, the corona and the solar wind. And then here is a planet with the ionosphere and the magnetosphere around it. And we'll come back in on Thursday to more of this. And this is the place where that solar wind is finally, remember I said that the reason it's going supersonic in the first place is because it thought it was expanding into a vacuum. And so it has followed a velocity path that is consistent with it being expanding into nothing. And interstellar space is pretty rarefied, but it's not nothing. So eventually it does figure out that it's got stuff up ahead of it. Just like the cars, it shocks. It says, oh, I've got to slow down because I now have to join interstellar space. Okay? Interplanetary space, which is the heliosphere, and then this is the astro. This is the, the galactic uh, region of space. And as you can see, it's, it's very small because we care very little about astronomy, right? We're, we're heliophysicists. So this is the portion we care about, from the sun out to what's known as the termination shock. So here's the, here's the picture of the overall plasma density. It's very high at the center of the sun, and it falls off. Okay? Here's that jump that we talked about where the temperature has to go from very high to very low to conduct heat downward. And you get this transition region where radiation is now much more effective. This is actually the density you get at the photosphere. That's below what we talked about. But this is the transition region sort of in a cartoony way. Here's the portion of the corona that really accelerates the, the portion of the corona we see in, the, in these EUV images. And it falls off. And then we get to the solar wind that falls off. The density falls off as r to the minus 2. Remember the mass flux, which is basically the area, r squared, times the density times the velocity has to be about a, has to be about a constant. Because we're just imagining the sun is emitting stuff at a, a constant rate. So if the area is going up as r squared, and the velocity has kind of maxed out at what it was launched at. It's, it's going supersonically, so there's not much around that can push it. So the density has to fall off as 1 over r squared. And more or less, that's what happens. And then there's the place where it jumps up again because it's hit the interplanetary space, interstellar space, sorry. Um, about 10 to the 15, that's, this is an astronomical unit. That's 100 astronomical units, roughly where the transition, the termination shock is. Uh, and then the thing that we'll get to a little later is you notice there's a big jump in the density here. That's because we have plasma from the planet itself. And we also have a jump because there's a shock there. So 
big picture of what the density of our plasma does. The things to notice then is where you have bumps like this. This is where the plasma is being introduced. These are sources of plasma. So obviously the sun is playing all the role of feeding the solar wind. The solar wind is, is a, uh, sort of driven outward from the sun as it's constantly adding heat and therefore material to the solar wind. And then here we have another bump due to our planet. That is a source of, of plasma that we'll get to. That is the, uh, the source of plasma for the magnetosphere. Now we have the magnetic field strength. And again, I'm, I'm plotting it in Tesla. It's very strong there. It falls off and keeps falling off as you go away from the sun. And then, of course, the Earth has its own magnetic field. So the magnetic field in the vicinity of the Earth is very large. This is a source of magnetic field that we haven't really talked about, but this is basically showing you where the dynamos are. There's a dynamo at the sun, and there's a dynamo at the Earth creating magnetic field. Finally, there's the temperature. And we talked about this is the transition region right here. So the center of the sun out to the, sur uh, to the surface, which is sort of 6,000 Kelvin. Let's call it 10,000 Kelvin. And then we jump up to a million. And then as we flow outward, we expand. And that causes us to cool. Uh, if we were cooling adiabatically, this would be the rate of cooling. We will hear much more in the afternoon about how this isn't exactly what we observe. But here's a simple picture of the sun adds energy to the plasma in the corona that drives the solar wind outward. And the solar wind just goes out and expands and cools off. Uh, here is the shock that we get when suddenly we stop at a planet. And we go up to, and I put it in quotes because the densities are so low that it's hard to, to justify calling this a real temperature. It is an energy per unit particle. Uh, and it's, it's pretty high, 10 to the 7 Kelvin is what you get there. So again, there's a source of energy there. This is the source of energy that creates the plasma in our magnetosphere. We see a bunch of sources of energy. This is the, well, this is the source of energy at the center of the sun. What's that? What, what do we call the process that generates energy at the source at the center of the sun that causes a bump in the temperature right there? Yeah, that's nuclear fusion. Okay, And we go down, and we have this bump here, right? A bump in temperature. So that's a source of heat. What's that? That's what I did. Yeah, I wish I knew. I was hoping one of you could tell me. That's coronal heating. We call that coronal heating, so we know what it is, right? We don't know, we don't know what, the, what the real process is, but that's, that's the whole mystery right there. Why is this bump here? And these bumps here are the sources of heat from the shocking at the, well, at the magnetosphere. So the, magne the bow shock and the magneto tail. So these are our sources of heat um, in the heliophysics plasma. Um, and uh, there's one more I should have pointed out. There is heat that comes, and it's mostly in the form of cosmic rays. And we're not going to talk that much about cosmic rays here, I don't think. Those go up to a temperature that, if you assigned a temperature to it, would be tremendously high, 10 to the 12 or something like that. And that heat is essentially transmitted inward as the cosmic rays fill our, uh, our heliosphere. Um, so there's one more source of energy there. That is the, the particle acceleration at the termination shock. Um, let's see. Uh, I'll just, no, I'll just leave with conclusions. We'll end a little early today. Because we're not really in this summer school going to talk too much about the termination shock. I, I don't think Ben has any plans on talking about that. Uh, so basically the summary of what you sh should know as as card-carrying heliophysicists about the corona and the solar wind, right? Is the corona is there because there's heating. It's because something causes heat into the plasma, and the plasma is unstable in the sense that if you heat it, it actually radiates less and therefore gets hotter and hotter until it can drive the density up to create enough radiation to balance it. 
So uh, we need the conduction, and then therefore we get a higher density coronal plasma. Um, the wind, the solar wind, is essentially a, a product of the same process, except because the plasma can expand into space, it doesn't need to radiate. It doesn't need the density to be high enough to radiate. Therefore, it just carries the heat out away from the sun. And we have a constant advection of energy away from the sun because we have a constant source of heat at the sun. That's what creates the solar wind. We basically have this story, and we could understand some amount of the, uh, some amount of the, uh, of the behavior of the solar wind just from this balance of heat coming in and needing to send the material outward and needing to send it outward supersonically. Going through that uh, sonic point was very important. And that's basically the, the whole uh, source of the whole heliosphere that goes all the way out to the termination shock and is, a, is you know, the bubble that we study here. Okay, so I think I've left us a little time for questions and then time to get to lunch a little early. Any questions? Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, that, that is a good question. I'm hoping uh, Ben will tell us a little more about that. Uh, that was a very, that was a simple calculation that I could sort of spell out for you. I think uh, it really depends on the way you treat the, the energy source and how much of the energy is continuing to be added as you go out from waves. Um, I know one of the objectives, th there's also an issue of when, this, when the solar wind becomes faster than the Alfane speed. But both of those points are points that we would dearly like to observe with Parker Solar Pro. That's not going into six solar radii. So hopefully this, this simplified model is too simplified. Uh, it also has to do with the uh, expansion of the of the uh, magnetic flux tube. I assumed it was a perfect cone going out from the center of the sun. Real magnetic field lines go out either faster or slower than a cone. That would move, just in that simple calculation, that would move that point quite a bit. So there, there are models that are only slightly more simplified where they take that uh, radial expansion factor and determine where that uh, sonic point is. That Where that sonic point also is, if you track the math back, tells you something about the speed you're going to be at. So that that's really has more to do with where the sol slow solar wind is and where the fast solar wind is. It's buried in there somewhere. But as I said, I'm not, I'm not here to tell you the answers to those questions. I'm, I, guess, I guess I always feel like if, if it's an area you don't understand or don't specialize in, it's good to know enough about it to know what the questions are that they're trying to answer. Not the answers, but you should at least know the questions. And so, yeah, definitely that place where the solar wind becomes supersonic is a question. And now you hopefully understand something about the simplest picture of that. You'd say, OK, in that simple picture, it will be here. And obviously, there are complications that make it a, a subject of study. So, but yeah, I, I hope to learn more about it, too. Yeah. Yeah, uh, she, okay, yeah. So let, let, let me back up and say, right, so th that I showed you all these models, and this is a very common assumption to make. The, sol the source surface is at 2.5 solar radii. Uh, as I, I tried to emphasize, it's, a, it's an artificial construct, but people like to put it there, and why? Uh, and there are a number of observations, and they're essentially statistical observations things that when we observe the, s the solar wind, for instance, one set of observations is when we observe the solar wind at 1 AU with spacecraft, which location of the solar wind gives us the best correlation with our data? And so placing it there helps. I think coronagraphs, and maybe has some more insight into this, also show that that's sort of the extent of helmet streamers that you're going to get. You don't get any obvious closed field lines in, in coronagraphic images outside of that. But I think it was the first. It was correlations with 1AU measurements. They basically did a parameter study and said, this is where we like it best. Um, 
and it is far and away the most common choice. Um, and certainly the Wilcox Observatory, where I pulled a lot of this data off, just produces the spherical harmonics from that model. Although I know enough about spherical harmonics, I could adjust it if I wanted. Yeah. Um, All right, then with that, I enjoy your lunch.